Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan. And I'm the elusive Alex. The elusive Alex. I feel like I haven't been here in a while. Uh, it's been a little bit. I feel like you're always here. Like, at, I think on the last episode I mentioned that you might have been a ghost. Um, but, I, but I am pretty pale. You, <laughs> well, you know, this time of year, too, especially. You need to get a little bit more sun. Yeah, yeah. yeah sun. You never know. You never know. It burns. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. I, I forgot. You're a night stalker. Yeah, it burns. <laughs> Literally, that's your job. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Unfortunately. You've been doing streaming still while well, uh um, have you? You say that. I have okay. not. <laughs> you have not. I haven't figured out a game I want to play. Oh like, I I always get these games, I'm like, cool, I kinda wanna play, and I'm like, I don't really want to play it like on stream though. Oh, there's a there's a game that everyone's talking about, especially for this year, called Phasmophobia though. You should just play that oh. and be a ghost hunter. <laughs> and then it'll just be like, Who are you gonna call? Phasmophobia Busters. And I'll just be like, Among Us. Among Us. <laughs> and Fall Guys. And f no, that one's already dead. That's already dead? <laughs> I think it's already dead. <laughs> well, hey, you know what? But that's perfect for this time of year. Because that means there's zombie Fall Guys. And that makes me there think of Halloween. And <laughs> There you go. Uh, if you are trying to betray your friends in Among Us, or find ghosts in Phasmophobia, or dealing with those zombie Fall Guys, because they probably did die when they fell off of the... You're probably thinking of Halloween, which is right around the corner. And I don't know how much candy I'm planning on consuming, but it is definitely more than normal. Um, You're planning on consuming all the candy that is in the form of turkey uh, dinner, Thanksgiving <laughs> dinner, candy corn. Yep. Sorry, I couldn't remember what it's called from it there. Yeah, it's turkey, turkey day candy corn, I think is what it's called. A, a horrible abomination of nature, which I will probably end up trying, and if I do, I will make a video of it. I swear. <laughs> but since it is almost Halloween, I thought that it would be a neat little change of pace to just tell a couple stories about our time playing tabletop gaming, where fear was an actual factor. Like, real fear? Or, like, our characters had fear? Our, our characters had fear, or we were fearing for our characters? I always uh, fear for your characters. There's been some times where I was a little bit concerned, but uh, when I say uh, fear factor, I don't mean the actual show fear factor. No one remembers what that show is anyway. No. What is fear factor? No, uh, actually, don't tell me. No, I won't. It's um, scarier if I imagine it. Yes, it probably is. So the story that I think I probably had touched on once or twice for, for me, but I thought I would go into a little bit more detail on it, was I was playing Rembrandt, and for folks that don't know, Rembrandt is basically a, a six-foot-tall, glowing turtle, uh, shadow monk. He's, he's a teenage mutant ninja turtle, and he's, he's usually pretty burly. You know, he's, he's got a lot of hit points. He has a pretty high armor class. He punches really hard. So I don't usually worry about his safety, but there was a point where we ended up in a, a city. And the members of our crew were kind of scattered a little bit. And I went out with our halfling barbarian, Connor, uh, onto the streets at night. Now, of course, it's already night, so this is going to be a little bit scary. But we were doing a little bit of investigative work on this uh, cloaked group that we were following. And I was trying to tail some folks while we were out there. While we were out there, we ran across this girl. Uh, who we met a little bit earlier and was trying to tell us that her sister was sick. And I thought to myself, well, we just stole this chest from the cloaked figures, and now the authorities are all over the place, and the cloaked figures are wondering who broke in, and if she has a place where she's hiding out, maybe we could go there, and I have this chest now. Maybe we can lay low and I can open up that chest. Right. She's telling me where her sister is and so we go off down into kind of this cellar and as I'm going down with Connor I'm starting to get the feeling by the way this place is described that things are not exactly the way they seem we are going down a set of stairs to start and as we get to the bottom of the stairs 
there's sort of like, I guess the, the way Dom tried to describe them to me is they're like cellar rooms, basically. Uh, and then on the far end of the room, there's like a vault door of sorts. It's kind of big, heavy steel door that is open. But now attached to the ceiling are a bunch of rags. There's, oh. there's just rags attached to the ceiling. I, I guess my character was like almost seven feet, actually. Yeah, it was seven feet. Uh, so I would have probably had rags like near my head, right? <laughs> just to, like whipping me in the face. Just kind of dirty, kind of oily rags, just all over the ceiling, which, you know, seems a little out of place. We go in, and she tries to kind of, like, lead us through the first door, and she wants us to go ahead. And I'm like, mm, no, you first. <laughs> I'm, I'm not having you close the door behind us. You go through first. So, uh, so you know, I passed a speech check. And she agreed to go through the first door. We get into another room. Again, kind of a dirty cellar area. And more rags attached to the ceiling. And uh, the entire time, I keep thinking about exit plans. Because at this point, I'm starting to think I might need one. And so, I'm a shadow monk. My initial thought is, okay, can I see the street at all? And what Dom basically said was, well, there are some bars over on the side uh, that peer out onto the street, so you can actually see the street from where you are. Because my thinking is, well, if I really needed to get out of here, shadow step. I'm out. <laughs> I'm out of here. Immediately. Uh, sucks for Connor, but... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bye. Which was really the problem. It's like, you know, I'm not really going to leave Connor if things are going to go badly here. But, um, but if he's all sad, then I can get out of this situation very quickly. Um, but anyway, we get through this next set of room, and, and I avoid a will save, so I didn't get charmed. Once I started to realize that this little girl apparently can charm me, that was also cause for concern. And we get into the next room, and it's around this point that I'm like, well, things are just not gonna go well. I just get a feeling. Because over in the corners of this room, even though it is very dark, and the, the light is very dim in this room, uh, and I can't light a torch because there are rags all over the <laughs> ceiling, and I didn't want the whole place to catch on fire. Oh, you should just lit it all on fire. Well, I did at one point, well, I'll get to that point. But um, over in the corner, you start to see eyes of other little urchin children. Perfect. And the entire time, this little girl is just saying, My sister, my sister is sick. Through this door. And there's another door. And there's a, an odd machine over in the corner that smells a little bit bad and all these kids with the eyes and everything. I kind of, at that point, uh, just say, no, I don't think we're going to do that. And kind of actively put a put a you know a foot down. And it's at this point that the illusion wears off. And we find out that these urchin children are actually like uh very disgusting uh creatures that have put on this guise to fool so people. Fun. Yeah. Oh boy. So I'm I'm sitting there like, well, we made sure that the door was open behind us and they couldn't close it behind us. So there's that. And I don't know how many of them there are. And it looks like there are more that are now uh, barreling towards us from the other open door that she was trying to lead us through. There's some kind of ghasts or ghouls or something. But, um, you know, they were they were kids and I'm a big shadow monk. So, no problem. So, my first thought is, okay, I'm going to bonk this uh, girl on the head. And uh, I think I succeeded the first time. But then, they attack. And the first attack not only damages me, but weakens me. That was fun. Yeah. So, now I've got status effects. And my health is like a quarter down. <laughs> and I haven't really made much progress on the whole attacking them thing. Yeah. This is where I started to get a real sense of uh, concern <laughs> for, 
for where my character was because I feel like at that point we were in a murder box basically <laughs> we were in a kill box and had stepped into it willingly uh so my thought at that point was like maybe I'll just get a torch and I'll just light it and, and I'll throw it at them because they apparently don't like fire if they're in these dark quarters but then I got reminded that wait the rags on the wall they're on the ceiling so if I light a torch in here basically the whole thing is going up in flames that's probably not a great idea um I take my treasure chest and I chuck it at the girl <laughs> instead and we beeline it out of there, close the door behind us, and we hear the scratching from the other side and, the, you know, these roars, these cries from the other side, just, you know, battle cries trying to get through this door. They're um, going to eat you, make turtle soup out of you. They're going to try to make turtle soup out of me. In the meantime, the rest of the crew who's listening to this is like, who gets Rembrandt's stuff? That's their comment while this scene is going on. And they're like, dibs on this, dibs on this. Now, Connor uh, is, a, is the barbarian kind of class where he has a little bit of magic uh, to his name. I can't remember exactly what the subclass was. Whatever it was, he was able to actually freeze the locking mechanism in place temporarily to keep them from opening the door. We run out of there immediately. Uh, up the stairs, out the door, and, and now we're out. However, uh, I don't really want to leave the chest in there <laughs> that I threw at them, because it might have had valuable intel in it. So I think to myself, well, I have an idea. All the town guards are out looking for those cloaked figures, and us, apparently, because we had stolen that chest. Okay, are there any guards in this area that I can that I can talk to? And Dom's like, well, you know, you're in earshot. Yeah, there's probably a guard down at the end. Okay, great. Great, great, great. So I get the attention of one of the guards. And I'm like, guard, guard, over here. I saw a bunch of hooded figures going down into this cellar with a chest. <laughs> and so they, they come over, and, and she grabs a bunch of other guards. I'm like, what are you talking about? They, oh, they, they had cloaks on and everything, I swear. They went down <laughs> into the cellar. So she goes, Oh, oh, okay, boys, we're going in. And so, like, six of the town guards just go down into the cellar because I told them that the hooded figures were down there. And they, they weren't. It was the, the, the kid demon things. Yeah. The, the basically what happens after that is a struggle ensues that we aren't really privy to, except we can hear a lot of screaming and slashing. In retrospective, I was like, oh, if I could shadow step out, I could have also shadow stepped back in to help them. Yeah, who would want to help guards? This is true. They're expendable. They're like foot soldiers. They've got red shirts for a reason. <laughs> exactly. And the, the captain comes back up and is like, what were those things? And I was like, I don't know. I mean, I did tell you that it was pretty creepy down there. And she's like, all right, well, you're going to have to come down to the station. So, so we grabbed the chest, and they kind of forced us to go off to the station with them. But at least I, wasn't, I didn't have to deal with those little kids anymore, so that's great. Uh, kids, there you go. Kids are terrible. Um, yeah, kids are terrible. <laughs> we get to the station. The rest of our crew are also being detained at the station for another reason. because. It's a D and D party, so <laughs> so of course it's obvious that they have it in for us. And one of our compatriots is currently getting beaten up by the captain of the guards in another room, which is their kind of enhanced interrogation process. So the upshot of all of this is we had to leave that town that night uh, after we accidentally uh, set the station on fire. <laughs> trying to escape so something did end up setting on fire at the end of all of this and, and and escaping with our now tortured npc partner by carriage uh out the middle of the night there you go so anyway uh kids 
the scariest thing in D&D? Uh, yeah, probably. This reminds me of something. For the scary from about players years ago. Oh, it's yeah? probably six, seven, eight years ago now. Oh, yeah? Maybe? I don't know. A bunch of years ago, anyways. A game I was running. Oh. Uh, I decided that we wanted to have some, I think, fiendish template rats. Or mm. rat swarms. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In his basement, and the party went down. And uh, lo and behold, long story short, uh, when you apply the fiendish template, uh, critters get uh, damage reduction and stuff. Oh. <laughs> so they couldn't be damaged normally. Mm-hmm. They could only be damaged by bludgeoning weapons. Right. The party didn't have any bludgeoning weapons on them. Mm-hmm. And they also thought that lighting the rat swarms on fire would be a really good idea. Of course. Um, which, it would have been a great idea. It would have been really great. Uh, fiendish rat swarms, however, have fire resistance. Right. And lighting things on fire does not overcome that fire resistance because it doesn't do enough damage per round. Right. So, uh, you know what they did? Mm. And I let them because it was kind of my kerfuffle of being like, oh, well, you guys can't take this on because you have no tools to do it, my bad. Right. Um, you know what works as a really good improvised weapon? Hmm? A, a, a warrior in breastplate? Mm-hmm. Rolling around. <laughs> yeah. Because, yeah. uh, yeah, he'd stopped, dropped, and rolled all over him. He was covered in dead rat. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was pretty brutal. Dead rat armor is definitely not the kind of armor I prefer to wear. Did he gain AC for having all the dead rats on him? You know, I don't remember. <laughs> uh, same game. Same game. Uh-huh. We actually... Speaking of children being terrible, yeah. we absolutely use the child as a, a, a point of contention. Oh, boy. And I don't remember exactly what we did, but uh, this child had been, like, needing help. Mm-hmm. And so someone in the party took a real shine to this, this orphan child. Yeah. And we used that against the party, because it wasn't really a child. It was, I believe it was a succubus. Oh. With, like, a, a minor image or a, an illusion spell. To oh. appear like that, mm-hmm. and they charmed that one party member, who then turned on the other party members, and then we had an epic fight uh, between them and the succubus uh, because it was very, it was a demon. I don't know if it was a succubus itself, but it was a demon. Um, huh? Yeah, that it ended up not being a very uh, long fight because one of our party members really brutalized it, but we extended it for cinematic reasons. Sure. Um, yeah, don't trust children in games, guys. Do you th- uh, do you think that the kids that Rembrandt encountered were succubuses or demons? Or no, something? I no. don't think so. No, I think they were just like rats of unusual size. Oh, they were rats of unusual. <laughs> well, okay, that's also terrifying. Maybe they had uh, <laughs> the fiendish template on that. I don't really know. I I think the the reason why that one always stuck as being the most dangerous for me is because it is a fight that I realized I needed to run away from. I've had so many of those as a character the last time I played with David as my DM. Mm. Uh, there were lots of those, with Hef and Chump, uh, where one of us would go down because it was just two, the Bard and the Druid, and we would get into a pickle and it'd be like, yay, hey, time to run, bye! And in fact, the one time that we got in a situation like that and it was just me, Mm-hmm. Is when Hephaestus died. Yeah, he got better though, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, I got better. <laughs> I died, but I got better. Yeah, he he was fighting a big a big demon, and like it was, we rolled for it to figure it out. And it's like, do I recognize it? Because I had some knowledge or that. It's like, yeah, you kind of recognize it. It's like, how do you want to recognize it? Oh, I'm like this creature's an ancient foe from my island, and mm-hmm. like. We've had stories of this creature, and I recognize it based on its description. And it's like, but based on that also, being an ancient enemy of my island, there's no way my character is backing down from a fight from it, regardless if his life is on the line. Mm. And it was. Um, it wrecked me. Yeah. Oh, boy. It yeah. wrecked me. I jumped on it from above and, like, tried to stab the crap out of it. Apparently it was didn't really care about the type of damage I was dealing, so mm-hmm. I didn't really do a lot yeah. with my lightning sword. Yeah, I, I went full full tilt on it, and it went, nah, you good fam, and it cut me right in half. 
So how did uh, Hephaestus eventually get better? I don't remember. Oh, okay. Shump uh, recovered his body and brought him to a place to... Um, resurrect. Resurrect me. Which could have gone awry. Mm-hmm. Could have not happened as well. Like, it was a roll. It was a chance that I wasn't going to come back quite the way I was, but I, it worked out successfully. Oh, that's good. Oh, that's had good. I not been... Al- had I still been dead, though... I had a pa- I had a warlock lined up. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. A noble warlock, even. A noble warlock. It, yeah, his his background was noble. Uh, he's a his patron was a sentient weapon. He was a hexblade warlock. He was going to cross 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 class into paladin. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So his family line is like paladins and warlocks. It was going to be really fun if Rembrandt died. I had another monk that I was going to play. Of course. Um, but what you I gotta want... Repla- you gotta replace him with his son. What you do in that case, Nathan, is you have the party members carry around an egg that he left behind. Rembrandt Jr. <laughs> yeah. No, no, actually, I had a character in mind that was going to be an Aarakocra, and uh, she was going to be a Sun Soul monk. Ah. So I could have a Firebird, and I was going to call her Valkyrie. Of course. My thought process was, one, I get to fly, and also, I get to throw searing balls of heat at people while I'm flying. Perfect. But I, I kind of felt like Rembrandt wasn't actually built optimally for a monk. <laughs> no, he was terrible for a monk. He, he was. His dexterity was nine. <laughs> <laughs> terrible for a monk. Yeah. Unless, you have, unless you make up for that with the wisdom. Um, his wisdom was okay, but the thing Uh, that- That's like Shump, who is a terrible bard. Yeah. Yeah, and the irony is my charisma stat was pretty high. The- the one thing- his constitution was pretty good, his strength was 20. So I could make up for a lot of things by the fact that my strength gave me modifiers, because monks can use either. Um, but in terms of- of the optimal build for a monk, no- no, you need high dex, high wisdom. Uh, yeah. But, uh, yeah, no, he did not have that. So so he's a stealth monk, and he's actually got negatives to most of the dexterity skill checks. Yeah. So it was, it was not an optimal build. It, was, it made sense for the character, but I kind of wanted to play just a really well-built monk <laughs> as a follow-up. And I thought, I thought it kind of made sense. To have to go from having a monk of the shadows to having a monk of the sun, you go you literally go. from the dark to the light. But I, uh, I I have not actually gotten to play her. But I did kind of figure like maybe I'll just have Rembrandt sacrifice himself. <laughs> he um he did wind up in a hell dimension, a Technicolor hell dimension at the end. So um he, he might still need to get replaced <laughs> eventually. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, he's just sitting in hell, it's fine. He's just sitting in hell. It's He's sitting in hell with the brother of one of the player characters. There you go. Who's not much of a fighter. And, uh, and no matter where you walk, you never actually get anywhere. Sounds like normal. Yeah, yeah, it certainly does. And he's still wielding around uh, one of those Githyanki scimitars while he's down there. Oh, too. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good place. So I'm still fearful for Rembrandt's safety. I don't know. Do you usually find that it's easier to uh, manufacture fear when you're a DM, or do you more or less experience it as a player? Oh, man. Probably easier for me to make players fearful. Mm hmm. Of, like, their character's safety. Yeah. Uh, specifically. But, mm-hmm. like, I don't usually go for fear too often. Mm-hmm. Um, and I haven't played enough recently to really, aside from Hephaestus, mm-hmm. um, to have any periods of, like, fear or tension or anything like that. So it's, it's probably easier for me as a DM, but it's been a while. I felt a bit of tension when my ranger was in that crypt. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you woke up in a crypt with a, with a dead person. Yep. Having been blown apart. Yeah. Yeah, and, that was fun. And it, it only got worse from there. I, see, I, I can manufacture fear because it's like, oh, cool, you guys are starting in a tavern. 
uh, there seems to be something rough going on outside. Mm-hmm. Like, starting starting a game is such the worst part. Yeah. Because, like, what do you do? Do you do cliche? Do you do... Yeah. Uh, in media res, you know, do you start in the action? Mm-hmm. It's like, it's that's the hardest part for me as a DM. It's like, where do you start with people? Right. Right. Um, and I think that the last games I've run were kind of before I... New, like, Session Zero type thing was a thing. Mm-hmm. So, like, that, I think, would help as well. But, yeah. like, a lot, a lot of my stuff was just, like, not your typical starting situations. Right. Yeah, the uh, the one with the crypt, that was in Media Res. Yes, uh, you started in the crypt after someone had just used a fireball scroll. Uh, yes. And blown themselves up. Yeah, yeah. Personally, because, I think that worked better. Um, because y- your starting's... Your your typical beginnings of an RPG can be very boring. Um, <laughs> yeah, they are. Oh, you guys are starting in an inn. What do you want to do? Oh, well, we either follow this one lead that you're giving us here to a story, or we do whatever we want and sandbox it. Right. And the, the fun part is that you can kind of build that story backwards uh, if you're already in the middle of the shit basically <laughs> right it's like what happened why did like with you guys in the crypt it was what happened why are we here well, it's like well we're on a, we're on a, uh, a mission mm-hmm. or whatever we're on a task and yep. the person that gave the task to us is now dead mm-hmm. <laughs> yep yep so or the person that led us here is now dead yep so what do you want to do now <laughs> but yeah but you're in the middle um yeah i'm glad that we went with that scenario though because uh because uh. yeah uh, it it would have it would have well since it only lasted one session, um we yeah, would, yeah we yeah. wouldn't have gotten anywhere <laughs> before we ended. I think the last game I actually ran it started um with like a tournament type deal. Oh yeah, I think it was something like that. It was they were trying to find people to go explore, mm-hmm. and they only wanted some of the best people. So obviously my player characters did some competitions and won those competitions and they're like oh cool yeah we're gonna fund you to go exploring for us and expand our civilization and then uh, then the ranger ended up botching his nature check and they went the wrong direction no it's it knowledge geography and the, and the ranger went all right i'm gonna roll and i'm like "Ooh, that's a bad roll mm. do you want to try again he tried again i'm like "Ooh, all right cool so you see that river you're on you, you know that river is on the continent flow east Right. You're on the wrong side of the continent. They flow west. <laughs> so they're following this river. The player knew, but it's like, yeah, no, we're going to follow this because <laughs> because we would. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I'll, I'll, I'll let you make another check in like a day, but you're going to be following this river the wrong direction for about a day. God. Yeah, yeah, it was good times. Mm-hmm. This is why you guys don't want me running your games, I guess. This is, apparently. You also don't want There's me some... running games because that also ends badly. Yeah, no, that's true. Mm-hmm. They end ridiculously. They end ridiculously and quickly. I uh, had had a lot of really terrifying ideas for other things that I would have put them through in Rift Hunters that no one will ever yeah. know about. But it's fine. What I'll do is eventually, if I if I ever run a different game, I'll just repurpose some of it for. There you go. That's good. It's almost like people should just have us just let us run a dual DM'd game for them. Oh my god! And it will almost balance out. It it will. Ugh, I don't know if it will balance out. It might just be chaos. <laughs> it'll be utter chaos. It will be. It will be otter chaos. Yeah, otter chaos. I think so. Sixteen dwarves come down from the mountains, friends. <laughs> <laughs> They've got trinkets to sell. What we'll do is we'll. It will just be an otter centric campaign, <laughs> and <laughs> just be all about otters. That sounds rocky. You get it. Because uh, otters, otters have smash, a favorite rock. Yes, I know. Open. Otters have a yeah, favorite rock. Yeah. yeah, this is why we can't run games. No, we really can't. Mm-hmm. Because all of a sudden, yep. there's just going to be a horde of otters coming at you, chucking rocks. Swarm of otters. Storm of otters. Demonic otters. Demon. Demotters. Demotters. Demon otters. It's a Harry Potter game. Demotters. Dem otters. That would be a fascinating way to play Vampire the Masquerade, too. As otters? Vampire otters. Vamp otters. Whoa. That would be scary. You know what, folks? If you can come up with a scarier uh, creature to put into a game. I've thought of a scarier creature than that, Nathan. What is it? 
I thought of it. I had an idea for a race of goblins that was actually like mildly vampiric. Oh, so I was taking it from uh, remember those little pygmies in Act Three or Four in Diablo Two? Oh God, yes. Yeah, so you know those guys are the, the, the little pygmy assholes that hated shoot, them. Uh, yeah, okay. So goblins, but yeah. tribal goblins uh, that also live in the upper uh, branches of a jungle. Yeah. So they're a jungle race. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're very dark. They're vampiric. They drink blood. They use bone weapons and poisons. Uh, and they ride bats, like dire bats. And then the shamans can turn into bats. But they also use, like, blood, and they can give you, like, blood poison. Because, oh. you know, not good for you. But all their weapons would be, like, bone pick blood arts. Mm-hmm. And, like, bone clubs with stones and stuff like that. But oh, it would yeah. be terrifying because you're walking through a jungle with a lush canopy overhead and suddenly descending upon you from above scary looking goblins with red eyes from like the shadows like the the shamans would also have like shadow jaunt or shadow jump or whatever shadow step oh shadow step yeah so the bigger ones would have those Mm. but like suddenly you get swarmed by vampiric goblins wouldn't that be terrifying you know what that kind of sounds like? Eli Roth's D&D. That sounds like the kind of, of a movie that he would make if he made a D&D movie. It's just kind of uh, terrifying, and there's probably going to be some body horror involved, and it's just going to be unpleasant altogether. Yeah, I just figured it'd be fun, because you don't really see goblins that are actually dangerous, typically. You kind of see goblins as, like, fodder. mm but suddenly you've got goblins that are not just fodder. You've got goblins that are like, hey, we pose a threat and we s- ambush you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And like eight, like five to ten goblins that have blow darts and attacking from above and from the shadows and like poison you. Mm. <laughs> I don't remember who it was that said it, but someone once talked about uh, an, uh, a philosophy in role playing. If you want to make your party feel uh, like heroes, uh, give them one powerful monster to fight. If you want to make them scared, give them a lot of small monsters to fight. <laughs> yeah, a lot of small ones are way harder to deal with. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But if numbers. you give them one big dragon, they're like, we're heroes. That was a tough fight, but it was only one monster. Yeah. But if you give them like a clutch mm-hmm. of smaller dragons, it's like, oh shit. Because numbers count for a lot (laughs) yeah i mean more numbers is more attacks more attacks is not necessarily more damage but it means they have a lot more time to do things to you oh yeah and that was probably the reason why i thought it was better to run out of that uh cellar hole (laughs) probably Uh, because when you start to see all the eyes you're like oh yeah there's only two of us right now the rest of our party's not here so uh i guess the lesson is uh, if you see children or rats, uh, and there's just a lot of them. Or if you see rat children. Or otters. Vampiric otters. They'll hold your hands as they lead you into the underworld. Those might be things that you want to watch out for in, in a role-playing game. And in real life. Watch out for those children. They're going to be trouble. I'm hoping that everybody has not had quite as scary an experience with uh, tabletop gaming. If you have... We would love to know about it. Yes, tell us your scary role-playing stories or scary tabletop stories. It doesn't have to be role-playing. And maybe you rolled double snake eyes and went to jail in Monopoly. And then your pawn died. Sorry. You were playing the puppy. (laughs) And now you're dead. Yeah, going to jail in Monopoly has never been the same since they introduced shanking rules. (laughs) Those are optional, Alex. <laughs> you don't have Yeah, them. but I mean, they make the game more fun. It really does. Hopefully everybody is going to be safe for this Halloween season, but uh, we are probably not going out at all <laughs> for Halloween. Nope, I'm not. Uh, so, what we thought we would do is uh, have a special live show for Halloween. A spooky live show. Yes, yes. Maybe. It might not be spooky. It might be more like a Halloween party, but yeah, online. A live stream Halloween party. Live stream. We can all, we can all hang out, yeah. eat candy, drink Halloween themed beverages. 
we can uh, bob for apples. I mean, we can't technically bob for apples together. I'm sure there's a bobbing simulator. There's a bobbing simulator, I'm sure, somewhere. We might do that. We'll come up with some fun party activities and, uh, and share them with everybody out there. And, uh, and hopefully with yeah. some people that will join us. So, so. I might aim for 10. 10 would be actually probably a good idea, actually. Uh, then people can probably be around, maybe. But also, I do have my child myself, speaking of children, uh, and I kind of want to do some little, uh, like, watch a couple movies with them, because we're not going trick-or-treating, because uh, th- we're you know, not dumb. I'm just going to throw that right there. I'm guessing that most of the Halloween costumes this year are going to have some kind of mask incorporated into them. I mean, normally. Guessing. Yeah, I'm thinking probably we'll try for like 10 and then maybe end like 12 or a little bit after that, maybe. And we'll do some fun stuff uh, for people. We'll see how the night goes. Yeah, we'll see how it goes. We can do spooky things at the witching hour. (laughs) Witching hour, yeah. That's like two or three. I don't think anyone will be around still. No, no, I don't think we're going to be going to the witching hour. We can summon demons. We can summon demons. And then we'll do the scariest thing. We'll play Raid Shadow Legends. <laughs> and uh, I don't think we're going to have, just a programming note, I don't think we're going to have a regular show for the coming week after this. It's, uh, it's going to be election week. You know, I guess just instead of listening to the show, go and vote if you haven't done so already. We only give you basically the one encouragement <laughs> instead of Facebook doing it for five months. I guess it's important to hear tell. I'm going to say it is. Alex, if uh, folks wanted to find all of the spooky stuff that we do on the internet, where could they go? You can go to delvcast.com. That's right. You can go to delvcast.com. All of our videos and podcasts and other projects are over there. You can watch them all uh, at your leisure. And while you are there, make sure to check on our Patreon for other spooky things. Like the full version of this episode. Which is definitely spookier, trust me. (laughs) Consider becoming a patron while you're over there. We would really appreciate that. Thank you to our Shiny Level patrons, Bonnie Ainsworth and Nick. Thank you to Drunk Paul as well for being our, essentially, our Discord Shiny patron. Uh, Thank you to all of you out there for listening to the show. And make sure to follow us on social media as well. We're on that thing, I think it's called Twitter. I am at Citanium. I'm at EXP Limited, and our show is at Delve Podcast. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure that it's called Twitter. Is that what it's called? Yeah, why not? Sure. It's that. We can make up names. It's that thing with the bird on it. Twitcher. That one. Yes, it's, it's Twitcher on, now. It's on Twitcher. It has yep. a T, and and a bird. It's Twitch tube. Yeah. Twitcher. <laughs> Watch all of our videos on Twitch tube. That's the new. That's the new one. Uh, so as scary as this episode has been, it is going to be even scarier now because it needs to end. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us, and we will see you on the next episode. Goodbye. Goodbye. No, oh, we scared ourselves. Uh, damn.